So I'm going to start kicking off the questions. Cool. Um, so let's start with let's start with Vaughan. Actually, we have a question here that says, "You have obviously been able to create this great culture. So how important is culture, and how do you create and maintain it in a growing company?" That's a really, really big question. Um, I think the simplest answer is to create a culture that you want to be in, you know, and, and uh, that attracts people you want to be around. Uh, so you all have fun. Uh, you know, we've got this, we've got this very fun-loving culture at Vend, but it's balanced by, also by working really fucking hard as well. Um, and so it, it, it all starts at the top. You've got to walk the talk um, uh, and set that culture and set those uh, core values that define your culture right from day one and, and write them on the wall, you know, stick them on the wall. Make sure that everybody, when they join the team, understand what it is that uh, uh, contributes to the success of the, of, of the team from a cultural point of view. So for us, it's like number one, everything we do is to make retailers' lives better. Uh, number two, you know, we do impossible things. You know, we, we always pick the hard stuff, the hard problems to solve. And then number three is we look after each other because doing that other stuff is really hard. Uh, so we need to support each other. So yeah, uh, and you'll find that once you identify what those core values are for you, uh, it becomes really easy. And then it becomes self-replicating because you know, the, as your team starts hiring uh, more people, then they m make sure that they're looking for those, those values and, and the people that they bring on board as well. Cool. Scott, can you tell us um, what the most successful portfolio or company you guys have worked with to date? Um, there's there's a handful. I mean, all these companies are are at different stages, right? So the the older ones are generally going to be further along. So it's it's hard to pick favorites. But the ones uh, that we've been a part of that have done incredibly well are obviously Facebook. So we were the first outside investors uh, institutional in Facebook. Um, that was great. Uh, we were the first outside investors in SpaceX, who were doing really well, uh, and Palantir. So we helped uh, incubate Palantir from the earliest days, and now that's that's a really huge company too. So I'd say those are those are the three that we were involved in very early that have that have had that uh, full maturity. And then, um, in addition to that, recent ones are are things like Airbnb, which is just a fantastic uh, company, and one of those that has the network effects that are global, so that uh, it's a really plausible thing to believe that it would become winner take all. So following up from that, what made you invest in those big portfolios? Yeah, good question. I think I think a lot of people saw that Airbnb was taking off. Um, with that one, we invested at a time right after Groupon and Zynga had uh, bad IPOs, actually. And so a lot of the other investors in California were saying, well, obviously, late stage consumer internet's a terrible investment. Let's not do that. Uh, so we said, well, that's probably wrong. What can we look at? And so we picked out what we thought was the best late stage consumer internet investment, which was Airbnb. Uh, and turns out it's, it's doing quite well since. Um, I'd say SpaceX was the one that really nobody got. There were even other investors that wrote letters to their LPs, their investors in the fund, that said, don't worry, guys, we'll never do anything that stupid. That was like the worst investment ever, obviously. Um, but we looked into it and we saw, you know, number one, could you cut down costs in space by a factor of 10, what would that do for you? Uh, and for the industry, that would be massive, we thought. Um, and the reason that people thought it was so bad, actually, was that there had just been three launch failures, uh, which to the outside world just looked like, okay, three strikes and you're out, all three went bad. But if you looked under the hood, you saw the first one you know, made it off the pad a little bit, and then there was this a crack in a fuel line that took it down, bad luck. Uh, and then the next two, each one made it way further than the one before it. So while they were failures, you saw that like it was almost making it. Um, and, and you could basically predict the next one's actually going to work. Um, and by the way, SpaceX had these huge contracts from the government. And those contracts would, you know, if they could do them, would bring in actually more cash than the entire valuation at that, at that time. So it was like, well, there's more cash coming in the door than they're even asking to value the company at. If they can do it, we think they can do it. And then our team had worked with Elon before and just said, well, this guy, you know, you just give him money and he's going he's gonna to make it work. <laughs> um, Azel, um, I have a question here from the audience, which um, is, 
What is it that makes it most challenging being a young female building a tech startup? And how do you personally overcome these hurdles? Uh, it's a really hard one. Um, I don't even think of myself as really being a female in this space, um, although I am. I've never once said like, oh, it's, it's really amazing for a woman to be doing this. Hell no, we do way worse things, like have a baby. That's pretty hard, okay? And I don't think, and, and a startup is like having a baby. Story um, is a toddler now, it's two years old. And I feel like it needs the same nurturing as um, a human does, all the right things love, care and attention, and we give it a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, the obstacles I think have been the same for me as my co-founder, Chris, uh, and we help each other overcome those obstacles. And really, it's just a wild journey to be learning and doing something that we love. Um, so even that there are obstacles, and some mornings it's, it is hard and tough, but when you're doing something you love, it's so much easier to um, look at those and go, well, I'm not going to care anymore and I'm just going to do my best and, and go for it. Awesome. Everybody smell for Paul. Paul's taking the, sorry, Paul Spain here, if you don't know him, <laughs> at Paul Spain. There we go. Paul Peter. Um, Sean. Okay, now this is a pretty big one. Are you ready? Right. <laughs> what can society do to reduce algorithms and to teach um, and to further reduce inequality and what are you doing about it <laughs> twitter not me <laughs> um yeah so sorry you know um i uh, i think if we look at like some of the biggest macro trends that are out there i think this this march towards a more unequal society is is one, I think, of the overriding macro trends of the next decade. Um, now that'll end in two ways. <laughs> It'll end up um, with uh, you know a world that probably looks more and more like certain parts of San Francisco, where you literally have to walk over homeless people to get to your um, free uh, lunch, free massage, free whatever startup with laundry and everything done on top, and you walk back home over the same homeless people. Right? It's a bit fucked up, honestly. Um, or it's going to crash. <laughs> we'll go down that path, and but I, I don't, I don't see any other path out of that. So it, both are not great options, right? So we have to really think as people kind of creating this tech is, is you've got to if you're going to build stuff, people to buy. There's going to be enough people to buy it, right? You know, this, this world of Uber for X only lasts so long, right? When you think of what that really means, it means let me create you know an algorithmic driven system that will farm out things to the lowest possible pool of talent, you know, that's fully fungible and, you know, it'll drive me around from point A to point B in a luxury town, you know, town car. Um, and uh, if you don't, you know, like my star ratings, you don't have a job, right? It's kind of a bit, a bit of a strange world, but that's, that, that's sort of, you can think of Uber for X as kind of really playing off the massive inequality that we've got where I can effectively farm out servants to do jobs for me, right? Um, I don't think tech is really, I think there's been a lot, there was a lot of, you know, uh, hope I think at the start about tech, you know, that, that it would create a better world, a more equal world, a world that we would have access to all the information for free, right? But I don't think, you've, if you look at the numbers that are around, that you can really make that argument and say that it's made the world more equal. At the very least, you've got to acknowledge that whatever impact it has in creating a more equal world, it has been outdone by something so much more vastly significant. Now, you can't really point to what that thing is and you start thinking, well, maybe it's tech. So I think there's a few things, right? So we look at like Airbnb. I sort of say it's a category defining thing and it is in many ways, but it sort of is also Craigslist, right? And those who don't know Craigslist is effectively a free site that lets you, you know, trade things backwards and forwards. Craigslist has been set up and has been run for the last 15 years effectively as a socialist company, right? It's been run effectively without maximizing profit. One of the most popular sites on the internet said, hey, technology, here you go, world use it, and we're not going to make too, too much money from this. And that's really, really different from running a company up to a $100 billion market cap. And you've got a choice, I think. You can run a company towards $100 billion, or you can provide a technology and make it accessible to people. And how you go about doing that will affect the economies that we create. 
So I think one of the things we really have to think about is in building these companies is what part are we playing in making sure that everyone benefits from the tech versus what are we doing to make sure that I as a founder benefits from the tech. And there's a balance, right? Um, and I think we as a society need to figure out what that balance is because ultimately if we don't have enough people to consume the products, you don't have a working economy. So carrying on from how do we <laughs> how do we let everybody share the tech and I didn't plug this question Vaughn can you can you answer for what each of the audience members could do to help you on your mission to encourage kids into tech and please tell us about OMG tech not plugged I didn't write that did, did you answer ask that question <laughs> um, okay I'm gonna uh, Think about this for about five seconds. What can we, what can we do? Um, I think the best thing that we can do is is try and imagine what the world is going to look like in ten years' time, because the kids that are going through school today, that's the world that they're going to be innovating in. And so, sure, I mean we can we should all teach kids to code because that's going to be a, an incredible skill for them to have. But that that might be a little bit short sighted, because the the world in ten years' time is going to be sensor-driven, uh, robotics, nanotechnology, hoverboards, thank God. Uh, and, um, and so that's the stuff that we need to get kids really passionate and excited about. And so there are some basic skills that they need, so coding, uh, engineering, uh, math, uh, uh, science, all the STEM subjects. And so that's, that's really, we kind of, uh, we've been obsessed by the internet by, for the last 10 years um, uh, or longer, but really the, the the, the new world is going to be more than just the internet, so we need to get kids back into those engineering subjects again. That's, I think, the most important thing we can do. I like that answer, thanks. Only because I teach engineering, so it keeps me in a job. Thank you. Um, and so Scott, the tweeter, says, um, I love the all-black shirt. <laughs> what are the New Zealand traits that you think are most important to nurture to make this an even greater startup system? Ecosystem, sorry. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd say it's already got a lot of the pieces. There's great tech talent, there's great engineering talent. Um, there's a lot of expertise in a bunch of different areas. Uh, people are really resourceful with what they have, and I think all the companies we've talked to so far on this trip, they've really taken what they started with and just pushed it about as far as, as anyone possibly could. Um, it sounds like one of the last remaining pieces is saying, well, okay, uh, we've got a great product, we've got product market fit, we're really scaling the company, we now need to go international, we need to raise more money. And from talking with a lot of people, it sounds like that's the last piece to really make accessible and like really easy for people. And I think, um, I think that's going to happen. I think it's just something that gets figured out over the next couple of years where more and more companies will succeed at crossing crossing that gap and, and going to that next level. Um, I think another big thing uh, that we're seeing in the early stages of is when you really start seeing an, an ecosystem evolve, it goes from you know, maybe nothing to like one really successful breakout company, or maybe two, and then the people from those breakout companies go and start their own companies with money that they've made off it or expertise and they're able to raise more money. And then those companies then put out their next set of really engineers and, and founders that then start their next thing and those employees it just keeps it keeps circling and I think um, what we're seeing already is that that's begun and so once that cycle happens and starts it's just a matter of time until it just keeps growing more and more and more um, so yeah I think that's a really exciting time to be in so everyone should appreciate that cool why combinate a Sam how many applications does Y Combinator receive, and how on earth do you evaluate them? Uh, we get more than 10,000 a year. Um, and how do we evaluate them? So we, we make mistakes is the first thing I'll say. At, the, you know, at this sort of scale, given our limited number of partners, we're going to get it wrong. And so um, we let in companies we shouldn't, and we don't let in companies we should all the time. And that's just, you know, we're upfront about that. We do as good, good of a job as we are able to. But we know we can't be perfect. And in fact, if we tried to help hold ourselves to be imperfect, we'd miss great companies um, because the, you know, the companies that go on to be really successful 
uh, don't always look great at the beginning. And so we're, we're trying to fund things that could be great, um, which means we're going to miss big time a lot. Um, but the way the process works is pretty straightforward. The, the alumni, um, we've chosen a few hundred of them to help us screen applications. And they can vote either maybe or no on an app. Um, that then screens out about the worst half of the applications. And then the remaining half, the partners read. And each application gets read by at least three partners. The ones that are near the cutoff get read by usually six partners. Um, and we give each app a letter grade. And then there's an algorithm that decides which ones get an interview. <laughs> That's it. Um, so then you know we interview, say, 500. And out of that, we fund, say, 120, something like that. And continue yeah. on from there. Actually, speaking of algorithms, I had one other thought on Sean's question. Um, and that was, I don't see it as purely an algorithm thing, the, the inequality. I think it's really a leverage thing. And so you know, you look at that chart and you see, well, early 1920s, you know, it really peaked. But what happened? It was the financial crash. There's so much financial leverage in the system. So it's like this leverage that existed actually backfired or went away. And so then that corrected um, technology. It's like Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough, I'll move the world. And I think technology naturally increases that leverage. Uh, you know, to the extent that you imagine back to the Ice Age, no one's going to be able to hunt and kill a thousand times more than anybody else, but the best programmer is a hundred times better than the, the, the average programmer. And so technology is naturally going to create this sort of stuff. Then the question is, well, what do we do? Do we stop the technology? Do we build specific technology? Uh, I think it's more about building specific stuff that's going to help. But in addition to that, hopefully the technology can just create so much more wealth that even if there's a little bit more inequality, Hopefully not a lot more, but even if there's a little bit more, everyone's five, ten times better off than they would have been. So that's that's the way I think about it. I'm kind of a little bit pessimistic on the inequality piece. I think it's really hard to fix with technology, but um, I'm hopeful that it just makes everyone's life so much better. I'll actually, I'll add my comment to that too. Um, I oh sorry, uh, you know I I think that growing wealth inequality likely will be the defining uh, social problem of our time. Um, I do think everyone's life is going to get better, but I think that people are more sensitive to the relative difference than the absolute difference. So yes, it is better to be poor today than to be a king a thousand years ago in terms of quality of life and life expectancy and everything else, but it just feels really unfair. Um, and that that is still going to be a huge problem. I think you know, it is really unfair. Um, technology, as Scott was just saying, has, you know, the, the long arrow of tech is towards more inequality because there's more leverage on individual ability and more leverage on assets and everything else. And you know some of that's fair, but a lot of it's not. Um, I don't think the way to do it, though, is to try to stop technology or to try to say you should run companies and not maximize for profit. It is true that Craigslist has run as a social enterprise, um, but I think it is a terrible website, and it hasn't innovated in 15 years. And, and that's not the model that I think we should hold up. Um, I think it's OK for these companies to run and be very competitive and try to generate a lot of profits. I think, again, like Apple, most profitable company in the world. Look how many of you are out there using iPhones right now and how many people are so dependent on this. So I don't think we should actually try to fix this problem with technology alone. I don't think that'll work. Um, but I do think we have this you know, exponentially compounding difference in leverage and we, we need social fixes to this problem. Um, you know, like I think we are going to see the big countries around the world do some version of a basic income in the not distant future. And I'm not sure if that's the perfect solution, but I sure hope it works. And I think the situation right now is, is really untenable. Um, but I don't think we should try to stop technological progress to fix the problem. So then with that, do you think that we are the community that should bring up these issues? I mean, we've got Derek here, and Rebecca Mills, we've got the B team concept, right, in which you can make profit, but make sure that social justice issues have been evaluated. And then do you think the entrepreneurship mentality is also to make sure that we're not creating this big divide when we're striving for success in our companies? Well, I think that socially responsible companies are awesome and have a huge competitive advantage. And actually, in the current world, it is difficult to succeed as a not socially responsible company. Um, I think if we, if you look at the fastest growing, the largest companies that have started in the last couple of decades, they're all actually, they take social responsibility really seriously. And I think the whole B Corp movement is awesome. Um, so I think that it's, uh, 
you know, it's a requirement to be successful at this point, and that's good. But again, I don't think it's going to solve the inequality problem. The you know, technology does tend to concentrate wealth if you don't have social policy to, to counteract that. Yeah, I would also say if there's something that's like, if there's a real problem, if there's something that's obviously messed up, that's probably an opportunity for a company. I don't know what company, but if it's like a huge problem, there's a huge opportunity somewhere in there, and there's probably a way to hack it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask a question, if that's okay, because I've run out of Twitter ones, and then we'll put the roving mic around. My question is, having been through all of your bios and spent my night on Google trying to figure out who you all were last night, what is your opinion on education? So I'm not going to say who or what, but some of you have several collections of degrees, and some of you have, and I hate the word dropped out because that's not the word, but some of you have gone to tertiary institutions to apply for a degree and have found more success by leaving that degree and setting up what you've set up now. So does anyone want to talk about whether or not we should encourage our youth to stick to their degrees and graduate in something, because that's the safe bet, right? Or if you know what you're doing, should you just quit and do what you're supposed to do? Yeah, I'll, I'll call myself out here. So I was one of the people with multiple degrees. Uh, I'm not proud of it. Um, especially the MBA. But um, my undergrad was in engineering. I loved rockets, I loved aerospace. I wanted to learn about it. I took as many classes as I possibly could. I thought it would make me better at doing aerospace. Um, and I think it did. So for what I wanted to do at that time, it was useful. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up getting a master's because I could in the, in the four years. And I really liked all the coursework, and it, it made me better. And I went to work at SpaceX. So it was relevant for that. Um, and then I got the MBA because I was working on other stuff and it was a way to uh, extend that runway basically. So I'd say, you know, education, um, in my experience, it was helpful for what I wanted to do, but think about what do you, what do you want to do? What's the point B that you want to end up at? What's the strategy to get there? Um, if you're doing a startup, I think more relevant than university is a really great accelerator or incubator or, you know, in concert with actually starting a company. Um, so the only way to learn startups is to join a startup or to start one of your own. Um, I think Sam talked about that earlier. So I'd say, you know, education isn't good or bad. It depends on what you want to do. Does it fit into that strategy? Is it something that, that makes a lot of sense? So you just have to evaluate that for yourself. Anybody who did I don't have any, uh, I don't have any degrees. Um, I went to university for two years. I studied computer science. It was great. Uh, I really loved it, but I, then I, I left. I dropped out to start a company. Um, and I think the framework that I tell people that are thinking about this decision is um, just do whatever you think will be the highest leverage on learning. And if you think you'll learn more in school, then do that. And if you think you'll more, learn more working in some job, do that. Um, even now, like if I thought I would actually learn more to go get a PhD in something than I do doing my job every day, I probably would still do it. Um, but I don't think I will. And I, I also think that the world has changed so much in terms of the, the learning opportunities and the way to learn um, that people need to really critically examine uh, the conventional wisdom about the best way to learn and the best way to sort of use your time. Um, I, I taught a class online about startups this fall, and I got I don't know, many hundreds or maybe thousands of emails from people that said, you know what, I was in university. Um, I realized I was paying thirty or fifty thousand dollars a year, and I was learning less than I learned watching this. So uh, online for free, um, and it made me realize that I actually would learn more, you know, working for a company uh, or doing something related to startups than I would sitting in, you know, my freshman writing class or whatever. Um, so no value judgment about whether that's good or bad, but I think it is a trend that people are going to sort of get their education in very new ways. Yeah. Um so, I mean, for me, um, I've uh, obviously got, uh, uh, I think, about I did about 10 years of university. <laughs> I've loved every year of it. Um, I think uh, there's um, Scott, so one of my Scott's colleagues there, Peter Thiel, um, said once, uh, a, a Rhodes Scholar is someone who had a great future in their past, um, which, which I took as a personal slight. <laughs> Um, but um, I think I think there's um, a few things we should consider around about the education side of things. So I, I think New Zealand has some of the best um, education um, system in, in, in the world from what I've seen. And the quality of 
Um, I think the top students that are coming out of the technical programs here in this country are really, really phenomenal. And it's something that I think we don't fully value, um, that everyone here pretty much has an ability to go to a, a, a very, very good school and get a very, very good education um, coming out of university. So that's kind of one thing. Um, the second thing I would say um, is we have this kind of model of what a university is for, for kind of learning, and, and it's a sort of lecture classroom thing. But, you know, going out to Oxford, I sort of, you realize the kind of the history of the university, and, and it was, uh, and still is at Oxford, a tutorial system where you spend time with people who are kind of experts and they teach you what they know. Um, I think one of the things that we should think about as university is not so much people giving lectures and getting degrees, but actually view it really as a, an exchange of expertise between people dedicating a period of their life to learn about how to be um, an expert in topic X, Y, or Z. In that case, it's more like a guild. And when you think about it like that, you think about things like Y Combinator, it's a, it's a place to confer expertise on how to build startups. It's kind of like a guild. So, you know, is that really that different from what university really was? And should we kind of make the distinction? It's like, are you going to drop out of university? I'd say, no, you're sort of taking a different course, right? And so we need to think um, the university is not lectures and people, it's exchange of expertise. And so think about it like that. The third thing I would say is there's a tremendous amount of output by people like Michelle, people like, um, you know, the, the, the professors and the researchers. They publish 1.56 million scientific papers every year. It, what, what a tremendous amount of research that can be done and commercialized, right? And, and it truly is. You can pretty much go into any topic, look in the last three years, find a bunch of papers, and come up with a dozen different company ideas, right? But the problem on that is there's no one of that money goes back to the scientists that do the work. And so you kind of miss that break in the chain. If there was a way to have some sort of financial instrument that was rewarding the science that was being commercialized, I think we'd have a much better system that ran across that. So we've got to think about how to do that um, but I'd also say is that the, the people creating the science are the ones that we're building the technology on top of. So, you know, this, this distinction of inside and outside of university, I think it's very, very blurred. I think that, I mean, I, I went to university and I, I dropped out in, after my first trimester. Um, I was doing computer science and I also loved it. Um, but it started a lot earlier for me. Um, it started in high school and I knew then I wanted to do something really big. Uh, but the only next progression after high school was university and that's just like the thing that you did. Um, and I, I guess it was just, for, for me being in high school, uh, it was really hard to know what other opportunities there were out there. Um, so I think that we need to start early and actually um, show our kids in, in high school um, that these are the options that are out there for you and uh, get them to be more in interactive with each other um, in high school. Everything was do stuff by yourself uh, and that's just not how our world is. Uh, we're constantly engaging with people every single minute of the day and we have to really uh, foster being social and um, sharing ideas and, and a really big thing and really big um, point that came out today is not being secretive. We need to um, be open and explore our ideas, um, which for me, university didn't do. It was still really single, like this is my paper, this is what I'm doing. Um, I hope that changes. Uh, and also, uh, what I really hope changes is that universities start realizing the way that the world is moving. Uh, like the talent in Wellington, it's, it's the development talent in Wellington is still really hard because uh, the universities are still teaching really like old and basic development languages and like we don't hire people that have that skill. We don't. It's not what we look for. Um, so I think they just need to realise that and be open and uh, start attracting the right people um, and foster their curiosity. Hi, uh, my name is Chris. I'm curious about particularly to you, Vaughan, but also, I guess, to Sam and Scott. Um, I'm a solo founder, so, and it kind of sucks, but, you know, you have to do it. Um, I was kind of curious as to how you coped. And then I guess for you guys, like, as funders, how do you perceive and consider people like myself? It's, it has, it's good and it's bad side to it. The, the bad side is it's really lonely. Uh, you're not having somebody to lean on. Um, uh, but you, you can counter that by 
putting in place uh, uh, other people around you that you, uh, you know, those, those key initial hires become really, really important. You kind of treat them like co-founders um, and putting good governance around as well. So getting a, a really supportive board in place. Um, but the pros are that as a sole founder, uh, you can make really quick decisions. You don't have to have those arguments about whether you should go left or right. Um, doesn't necessarily, that, I mean, that assumes you know <laughs> the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, you balance that again by having that uh, a fail fast approach, which is like, well, I'm just going to try this and see, see how far I go with this. And if I screw it up, then I can at least back out of it and I can admit I made a mistake. Um, but yeah, uh, I was asked whether I'd do it again, whether I'd do it as a sole founder. I think I would probably next time around uh, find a co-founder because um, I think there's something to be said by having uh, you know somebody there on the same journey as you um, uh, that you can talk to late at night and, and bitch and moan to each other about things. Uh, I think just for psychological health, that would be a really good thing. We certainly prefer... Uh, two or three founders to one. It's not, we fund lots of companies with a uh, solo founder, but um, we we almost always hear a version of that, which is I wish I had had a co-founder, and if I do it again, I think I'd like to have a co-founder. Um, I think it's just really hard, and startups are always really hard. Um, it's far worse, though, to have a bad co-founder than to have no co-founder. So um, another thing we tell people is don't force it. You're, we'd much rather just fund you by yourself than if for you to tack on some random co-founder, which mm. is usually uh, company killing. Um, mm. But you know there are a lot of things in startups that are hard, and every startup has some extra challenges, and this is one of many. Um, I, I think it is important, though, not to delude yourself that uh, you know this is somehow not a negative, and instead really think about what you're going to do to mitigate the challenges. Um, because the data on it, and at least from what we have, is that uh, you do underperform as a solo founder. And the ones that we've had that have been successful have really gone out of their way to sort of mitigate the challenges that come with that. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that mitigation piece is really important. Um, you know, SpaceX, to go back to that example, basically solo founder Elon really started on his own. What he did to mitigate it was for the first, I think it was six months to 12 months before the company really got started. Uh, full time, he would bring together these experts uh, on the subject and say, can this be done? Let's dive into this. We'll meet up next month to talk about this. And those became the first employees at the company. So you know, they weren't really co-founders, but they were almost co-founders. And they were these people that uh, could help work on, work on these early concepts. And so it's not like there was one person going it alone, which is, which is really hard. One more thing I'd say is that the you know, when these stories get told in the media, they're always simplified to either co-founders or solo founder. And in reality, almost all companies fall on a spectrum between those. Um, you know, even in companies that have two equal co-founders, there's usually one person that really drove it and had the idea first. And although economically equal, if you asked anyone in the company, like, who's the clear leader here, there's often one person. Um, and on the other hand, on the solo founder piece, there there are often like very early employees, like Scott was just saying, that that are sort of co-founder-like in terms of their influence on the company and the culture. So um, it really is more of a spectrum, I think, than, than people say.